Hi there, my name's Andy Young and I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand and welcome to my Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Now, we've got a, an old 1982 Honda XL500 came into the workshop uh, and this is one of the August tasks that I said mentioned previously. Um, on, this on this particular vi uh, video we're going to be covering removing and replacing the steering head bearings. Actually quite a common job on motorcycles. Dirt bikes, very regular, lots of contamination. Um, bikes that you pull wheelies on, yes. Always changing the steering head bearings. And if you get a chance to upgrade, go for the taper roller kits as opposed to the ball bearing kits. They are much, much stronger. Okay, well I managed to get it, uh, as the parts that I needed pretty quickly. They were on the shelf, which did surprise me. Although the guy was a little bit unsure whether they were going to be the right ones. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, it is a change over year, 1982 XL500s, the steering head bearings are supposedly a little bit different to the 1983 ones, so we won't really know until we pull the old ones out and compare them to what's in the new box. Um, so, first job, it's on, on the secondary stand because over here, uh, you see a bit to my, my left down there, look, is Ben's TDR, that's still on the main hoist, which is rather annoying, but I've now got all the parts to get on with that, just need a time machine to make some time to do it. Um, right, so XL500 is going to be front wheel out, uh, front forks out, probably a little bit of stuff around the headlight area to, to maybe clear out of the way, and then we can drop the triple clamps and take a look at those bearings. Here we go. Right, first job then to remove the wheel, quite simply, we've got a little clamp here, four bolts. Now a quick tip with these when you put them back in again, they must, the clamp must touch at the top and the gap should be at the bottom. Don't have a gap at both ends and don't have the gap at the top. That's how it should be. And the tightening torque for these is usually about 10 newton meters, which is not a lot. So we'll get these just cracked off. And all it does really is act as a, oh that was loose, is uh, act as a clamp for the wheel spindle. Okay, 17 by the looks of it. Years and years and years ago, I had an old XL125, and then shortly after that, I bought an XR200. That was fun. I blew it up. Yes, yeah, seized the, you know, the big end bearing on it. So I had the fun to fix it. Right. Now, all we should be able to do now is just withdraw that spindle. There we go. Now, obviously we've got a brake drum to worry about, and on this side here, this is your speedo drive. Too bad. There we go. Just pop the drum out. It's a lot harder not on the main hoist, but there we go. Okay, so with the front wheel out of the way, we've just got to focus on removing the front brake cable from the forks. This bracket here. And of course, the bracket that holds the speedo cable. So we'll get those whipped off next. Pretty easy getting these forks out. Be quite interested to see what these bearings are like. I'm imagining some kind of carnage. The um, this bike was involved in a frontal impact not too long ago. The car pulled out. The front wheel hit the car. T-boned the car basically. And uh, the owner says that the the steering head bearings have only started to be indexed uh, since that impact. So. It's going to be a bit hard to tell, to be honest, but we'll pull them apart and have a look. And uh, obviously, get it fixed. Right, get that taken off there. Super. This is the speedo cable clamp on the right fork. We'll just get that pulled off. Good news is the fork seal's not leaking, which is... Uh, Another job that I have to do on that TDR. 
Okay, so the forks are pretty much ready to pull out. We've already undone these two bolts here to get that, uh, that front brake cable um, retainer out of the way. We've got two more bolts up here to undo. Now these don't need to come all the way out. Put two here to slacken off and two at the top. And they're all 12 mil spanner size. Ugh, aftermarket here. Now we're going to need to use a spanner for those, I think. Oh, my God, in there. Oh, there we go. That's easy enough. I think we'll get that headlight shroud taken out of the way next as well. And to get the forks dropped out. Great stuff. So make sure they're, they're plenty slack enough and then we should be able to wiggle the forks out. Well, that was easy. Now with those forks and the wheel out of the way, all that extra mass is gone. You can really feel, you can see it look, the indexing on that front. See how it drops straight back into the center line position? That's terrible. And it really makes the bikes pretty much unrideable. Very, very hard to ride. Most annoying as well. Okay, so let's get the, uh, the headlight cowl and probably the headlight out of the way for now. One less thing to break later on. aftermarket stuff on here. This isn't standard. And neither is the bracket that's holding it. So we need ultimately to remove the top and bottom triple clamps. Um, let's get the front mud guard out of the way. That's a 10 mil. These are all really loose. Look at that. Okay, we've got a washer on the side that's going to probably get lost. So just grab that one. There we go. One more to go. Now, because we're going to be removing the uh, top and bottom triple clamps to get to the steering head bearings that are inside this tube here, we need to make sure that everything's out of the way that's got that's really attached to these, so that we can get them withdrawn easy later on. Because we're going to need to put them on the bench to do some work on them. So, I'll just undo that little bracket there, look. There we go, that can just dangle down. Now, we can get this horn out of the way too. That's uh, definitely causing a bit of an issue. Let's take those bolts out, I think, for easier. Okay, that's that one. And I'll oh, might as well take that out while we're on. 
Now, with the horn, this is an aftermarket horn because the original one's still on the bike, so it's got two. Uh, we'll just unplug that and then we'll plug it back in later on. Okay, Honda's also got this nice big junction box thingy mounted, which is these two bolts here. So we can get rid of his old horn, that won't need to go back on again, it's obviously dodgy. So a 12 and a 10. Right, 10 mil. Cool, that's free. We've got a bit of a wire thing to worry about on that wiring harness because this has got to come down, so that's going to cause that to move. It's very important when you're doing this kind of work to make sure you remember which of these cables go on either side. Yeah, the actual steering head because if you get on the wrong side, man, it's a bit of a ball ache sometimes when I get them, get them sorted out. Well done, Honda. What's going on here? I wonder if there's a plug in there. There might be. Let's have a quick look. It's obviously there for a reason. Oh yeah, that'll do. So we should... Oh no, it's just a breakout look, isn't it? Damn, okay. That might give us enough now to get round there. There we go. Okay, so remind me later on, that's got to come round to the front. Perfect. Okay, let's work at the top side now. Right, so we're going to have to remove the handlebars now off the top triple clamp. I need to make sure you cover the fuel tank in something that's going to protect it, because we're not going to unbolt and unscrew and detach all the cables and wires and stuff off the handlebars that would be ridiculous and uh, oh, really cool spanner time <clears throat> right Does Ben? You want to terrorise Auckland on his WR450? Forgot to tell him there's a police out this morning. He'll be fine. He's pretty good at eluding the police. Right. Okay. Now there should be. Oh, wrong way around. Right. Okay. All these little cl clamps here there's a, usually a punch mark or some kind of marking and the marking goes to the front. In this case, it was at the back. So when it goes back on, it can be back on that way around. Bye, Ben. <laughs> okay, now, handlebars. Now, with all this extra stuff and all the cable ties, there's a lot of things in the way. Ben. Right, another way of doing this is if you're in the garage, get a ratchet strap and suspend the handlebars from the roof. And I think in this circumstance, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, with the handlebars suspended, they're sort of out of the way. And so if you can suspend them, it's a really good idea because it means you're not, um, you know, you've got a lot more room to work and it's not going to bang the tank and there's no risk of chipping the paint. But I suppose it depends what kind of garage you've got and if you're having to work outside because then you've got no roof. Now, this is the main nut for the, uh, the steerer tube, for the stem. So we need to undo that nut and then we, can, we should be able to wiggle off the top clamp. Now, of course, we've got the ignition barrel bolted to the triple clamp. There's all sorts of wiring stuff going on. We've got a choke cable and things. So I'm aiming to keep the triple clamp on the bike, the top one and then withdraw the lower triple clamp down through the steering head tube because to take it off completely is a lot more work and the bikes only come in for 
steering head bearing placement, not to have the whole front end rebuilt. So fingers crossed we can get this cracked off and we should be able to wiggle this around, have enough movement on the cables to get this off the stem and forwards on the bike. Right, here goes. Whoa, that was loose. Jeez. That was really loose. Okay, okay. So that's the oh, there's a bit of a grommet thing going on in there as well. Look. So we'll get that out of the way. There's the nut. The washer. And now, there we go. We should just wiggle that off out of the way. Oh, perfect. Loads of room. I'll just pull the bike back a bit, I think. And that'll naturally keep that body out of the way for us. Super! Right, so next job we've got a little bit of rubber there again, take that off. And now we've got uh, basically a oh, lock nut, maybe, maybe two lock nuts. Let's have a look. Oh, just the one. Now, there should be a locking tab washer which you bend over on this particular style. You bend one of the tabs into one of those little square grooves. That's missing. Well, that's not a good start. We're going to need that. And what that does is it allows you to set the preload on the new bearings, and it's not going to move. You know, it's going to maintain that preload because without the locking tab, things can move around. Okay, so all we need to do now is just remove the lower triple clamp from the bottom. And oh, it's got taper rollers in it. That means it's been probably upgraded at some point in the past. These won't be the originals. Right, we'll stick that on the bench, we'll inspect that later. And to get the inner race out from the top, just put your finger in and we can pull that out. Now, of course, the bearings, this isn't just the bearing, there's an outer race as well, which is still in the steering head tube, and we need to get that out. And the standard policy is to use a long punch. Now, it just depends, I'll show you a picture down, of down the tube um, to explain the next problem that you might have. Okay, so looking down the steer ahead tube on the bike, you can see right at the top here, this is the outer race of the top bearing. And if we look down below, going under the bike, you can also see that that there is the outer race of the lower bearing. Now the problem arises is how do we get these out? And we're, we're completely reliant on how much um, there's a difference in the diameter at the top of that bearing, let me get a screwdriver to show you. Here we go. Okay, so we are completely reliant on the difference in diameter between the steerer head tube and the top of that race. That, that step is all we've got to put a punch on and punch it out. Now, some manufacturers, there is no step. The steerer head tube has a really big shoulder and it actually comes inboard of that race. That's worst case scenario, and if you've got that, then man, it is really hard, and quite often I'll just weld a bolt or a piece of steel across from one side of the race to the other, and then of course I've got something in the middle to whack on with a bit of tube. Um, sometimes they leave a notch for you, so you have a notch here and one at the front or one either side, so you can get your punch in again onto, to contact that in a race and get it out. And in this case, we've got a, a little bit, it looks more than what we've actually got because the steerer head tube recedes back just before the bearing. So there's not going to be much to go at. I have a really old pound through flat screwdriver that I use for this, which is really useful sometimes. Maybe that's going to work on this one. If you look further up the tube as well, again you'll see, let's try and get it to focus for you. There you go. You can actually see the top race. The top race the shiny ring, that's the actual bearing race itself. That shouldn't be too hard to get out. But if we look from the top down to the bottom, you might see what I mean. Okay, so looking down from the top, oh, okay, so we've got a bit more exposed inner race 
at the front and the sides but if you look we've got basically hardly any exposed at the rear of that tube so we're not going to be able to make contact with that bearing race at the back just the sides and the front okay that's a bit of an issue okay let's give it a go see what happens right I think what we'll do first of all is get rid of this top race that's probably going to give you a pretty good camera angle where you are there so let me go and find some stuff right okay my apologies you're going to get bashed around a bit because you're actually mounted to the fuel tank at the moment but it does give you the best possible angle to see what's going on okay we're going in now remember to wear your eye protection on this kind of stuff and the idea is to try and get under that lip best you can and be able to punch the bearing out now this actually has been pretty rounded over the years but I might have to re-grind it flat and get a sharp edge on it, we'll see. Otherwise, it's not going to actually get much of a purchase on that bearing. Now, nah. okay, I'll give it a sharpen up. And you need something with a really good sort of flat surface so you can get right in there and get some purchase on that uh, inner race. Uh, it's important to evenly do this from side to side. Otherwise, if it twists in the tube, you're not only going to damage the tube, but you're going to cause yourself lots of problems getting it out. Perfect. Look at that. Almost like I knew what I was doing. Okay, fingers crossed. Here we go. You can see more than I can this time now. Ta da! Now, how are we doing? Yes, I'm back. Um, well, we've got the top inner race out and the top outer race out of the frame. That bit's done. And we've just pinged out the bottom outer race. That wasn't too hard. And the tools that I used for that was an old, you know, old pound through screwdriver, because you know it's pound through, it's got a big metal, um, you know, the actual shaft runs right through the handle to the end, and it's okay to be whacked with a hammer. And it even says it, look, shatterproof. Hmm. Wasn't breakable proof though, was it? Because this big flat screwdriver years ago was about that long and it snapped. And that was me doing something stupid with it as usual. But it gave me a new tool. And this now is brilliant. Although it's getting shorter over the years, it's brilliant at removing steering head outer races. But you need to have the end of it nice and sharp with clean sharp edges on it. So that when you're punching the bearing surface, it actually, it's got a flat edge to it, so it doesn't sort of bounce off. If these edges were all rounded, it gets ricocheted off. It just can't get a good purchase. So on a regular basis, I have to sharpen this up and make it a, a nice flat uh, edge again. You know, a 90 degree edge at the end. But we still have one race to get off. And that's that one. Now, there are special tools in the industry where we can put a a proper bearing removing tool behind that bearing and it will help us to press it off. We can use pullers and all that kind of stuff. You won't have one of those. It's unlikely you'll have one. So I'm going to show you the way that you can do it without the special tools. You're going to need a grinder though and a punch and a hammer. Oh, and talking of hammers, I didn't use a normal hammer when I was using the screwdriver. I used what I call my magic hammer and it's a copper hide hammer. It's got hide at this end and copper at this end, and I find it gives a better a better sort of thud for removing bearings. Don't know the physics behind it, but it just seems to work really well. And it doesn't bounce as much, because this is a really soft metal. You can see it's all, you know, been bared back as I've been whacking stuff over the years. And I've had this hammer 20 years. It's doing really well, isn't it? And no, it's the same shaft and the same head. <laughs> Right, let's get this in the vise and I'll show you what to do. 
Before I do that, it's a bit close, wasn't it? Sorry. Um, before I do that, I've just noticed putting this in the vise. This is one of the very rare lower triple clamps that the the stem, that's this piece here, is clamped into place in the bottom. Normally they're pressed in. Once they're in, they're in for life. You can't take them out. But this one has got a bolt. Now, on this particular, on the XL500, the 1982 one, this particular bike, the easiest way to remove that bearing would be to undo that bottom bolt there. That would uh, release this stem from the lower clamp. And then we could use a press or a hammer with a bit of wood and we could hammer that down out below. And that would force the bearing off as it went down. Really cool. And something you could do in the middle of nowhere, which is a really good idea. So well done Honda for doing that. Um, however, most motorcycles don't have that clamp. This is pressed into the lower triple clamp in the factory, and that's where it stays, never to come out. So I'm not going to use that method. I don't want to because I don't think it's relevant to most motorcycles on the roads. And lots of people are going to be watching this video who are going to want to be changing steering head bearings on other motorcycles other than just a Honda XL500 from 1982. So we'll leave that bolt alone, we're not going to disturb uh, the stem and I'll show you what you need to do under normal circumstances if you haven't got the special tools, how to get that lower inner race off. Here we go. Okay, so I've mounted it in the vise. Remember we're not using that bolt, that's as if it doesn't exist. There's one big, big casting as it normally is. And we've got the cage and the, the taper rollers, these rollers here in the cage and we've got the lower seal. So the first thing that I do, and there is always a possibility of luck, that if we actually use a punch, basically we're going to destroy the seal, that's fine, because there should be a new one in the new kit. And uh, we're going to basically use the rollers to make contact with the lip of the actual inner race, uh, to punch the inner race off. Now sometimes they're not on there particularly tight, and that can be done. So we'll give that a go. You do need to wear eye protection for this, that's very, very important. These bearings have a, you know, a tendency to shatter, it's all hard and steel, so is your punch. And things can really, really go wrong. So you can see now, I'm aligning the punch with one of the rollers, and that roller is in contact with the inner race. And we'll just see what happens. And we're going to spread that load around a bit. And if it all deforms and falls apart, it's not the end of the world. There we go. Okay, so all that's happened, which is usually the case, is the, the cage and the rollers have basically broken free. That's fine. Now, if I give that a bit of a clean, that there is the lip that I was working on with the rollers. And even if the rollers do start to move the inner race, sometimes that can chip off. It's pretty weak, and there's not a lot you can do about it. So now what we've got left on there is the remnants of the lower seal and the actual inner bearing race stuck on the stem. Okay, so now what we can, do, can we do? Well, the next, the next plan is we can get a flat punch, and we can actually try and just work our way around on that lip there. Now chances are it's going to break and crack off. Not the end of the world um, and it rarely works but it's worth giving it a try at this stage. Could save you a bit of, bit of grinding later on. So I'll pop it back in the in the vise. Get it good and tight. There we go. Now again lots of possibilities of very very sharp metal flying around. Um, so be careful. Oh, flat punch. Well, it's more of a chisel, but it will help spread the load a bit. It hasn't broken yet, but it certainly hasn't moved either. Okay, 
and you'll find it's much easier to get to this side of the inner race than it is this side because it's set further back on the triple clamp so trying to do the same thing here is much more difficult and the forces tend to be inwards as opposed to along the shaft so we won't bother doing that okay and one more go now you can also heat these things up with a bit of a blowtorch but if you do, you do risk drawing the temper of the stem. That can cause them to bend a lot easier. So again, it's not a good idea. Now you can see now the bearing's just starting to tear and that's gonna break off very shortly. However, look at that, we've got some movement Okay. There you go, so that bit's broken off. Not the end of the world. So now, we'll just flick it round, because you've got to punch these things off evenly, just like getting the outer races out. And we'll give it a go from this side. Now I know that the angle is far more acute, but we do need to give it a go. I'm going to use my magic screwdriver this time. Okay, so I think it's pretty fair to say that has worked a bit and now it's jammed in place. And usually it won't work at all. So what we now need to do, and this sounds really quite aggressive, but it's the way I do it, and it's the way we do it in the, in the motorbike shop sometimes if we haven't got the right kind of gear or the gear won't fit the particular bike, is we get the grinder. And with the grinder, we're going to very carefully grind away at the bearing race. Now, under no circumstances do we want to damage the tube or the lower triple clamp. This, is, this calls for some really accurate grinding, and I use, believe it or not, a slit disc, a partially damaged slit disc. I'm going to use a slit disc because even though these are designed for cutting, the amount of material we're taking out is very small, and using a slit disc allows me to have some really accurate positioning of the disc and not, hopefully not cause peripheral damage to the remainder of the, uh, of the components. We only want to get that off. Now, by reducing the section of that steel that makes up the inner race, at some point we're going to get, you know, maybe really, really thin and we're going to reduce it down tremendously so that when we give it a tap with the punch again, it's going to crack. And when it cracks, it's going to lose tension on the stem and be really easy to punch off. So here we go. Let's give that a go. seal out of the way so you can, you can see better what I'm doing. Right, so all I've done there is just initially just get rid of that bottom lip. So now we're running on a, essentially a flat surface. I don't want to remove the lower seal. I could, I could break that out of the way now, but it's actually going to help to protect the, um, the lower triple clamp. Now obviously I've gained by punching the bearing away, I've gained two or three mil. And that's why this is all loose. But probably for you guys, that inner bearing is not going to move at all when you punch it upwards along the stem. So everything's going to be really, really close and tight. So you'll be extra careful. So 
So you just want to keep eating away at it very, very carefully. And what we're going to start to see is as the section, the thickness of metal remaining, gets thinner and thinner, it's going to start to heat up. And as, you, as soon as you start to see bluing in the middle, that's a really good indication that you're very, very close to getting through. We don't want to go all the way through. That would be bad. Getting close now. We are really close. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we have just broken through. Now it's really shiny and it's hard to, to focus. There you go, use my thumb to focus on Mr. Camera. Can you see that little tiny circle on the metal? Now that indicates that we've gone through the bearing and that is the actual stem. Now, okay, we've not caused any real damage, it's just a, a minute contact. I and mean, you'll see how small once we get the bearing off. But that tells us that we're pretty close, there's not really much material left. So it's worth, at this stage, to give it a punch. And I'll show you what I mean. Now the aim was to never cut through all of the material of the bearing, the inner race. The aim is to reduce it right down. And now what we can do is get our punch. And we're just going to try and punch it. Because we've got this nice big flat now, we can punch it so it rotates on the shaft. That's the idea. So we'll do that. And we'll see if we can get it to rotate. I'm just going to move the camera, I think. Okay, better swing. Right. So all you do is you hit either side with your punch. There you go, look, it just rotated. So that means it's got a lot less pressure on it now. Now if it's going to rotate, it's probably going to come off. So we'll just move it in the vise and get it set up for giving it a little, little punch off. Now, ideally what you want to happen is for the bearing to crack down the area that you've ground. And, you know, sure, you can always grind some more. You know exactly where to stop now because you've found that, that sort of the thickness point. Let's just cut that down a bit. There we go. Right. Okay, let's give it another go. There you go. Look at that. Textbook. And you can see that the bearing now has cracked down where we've been grinding it. So there you go, a bit of a bit of a close-up for you. You can see the crack actually in the bearing. And they, they are really brittle, it's hardened steel. It doesn't take a lot for them just to split. And as soon as they split, they're nice and loose on the shaft. Here we go. So all I'll do now is just finish punching that off and I'll show you what uh, what we've got left. Almost there. Perfect. Right, so that's the lower seal and the bearing. There's the inner race, and there's the seal. Now if I give that a bit of a clean, you'll see that where we went through was just, I think it was just about there, which is, you know, there's no damage, it's, it's absolutely fine. Jeez, I hate glasses. Right, so what have we got? Well, we did it. We got the inner race off the stem. Now, with this particular stem, you can see, if I rotate it around, this is the side we were working on, this is the side, um, you know, where we were actually sort of grinding the bearing off and there really is no appreciable mark you can just make out the smallest scuff on that bearing surface and that's fine that's not an issue so that's how to get an inner race the lower inner race off your steering head bearings you know off your stem 
on your motorcycle. Um, you're going to need a grinder with a really thin disc. Now, these discs are not designed for grinding, they're designed for cutting. And that's why they sort of self-destruct after a while. Um, so, you know, you've got to go away and maybe cut a bit of steel, so sort of get the face back again, get it back to usable condition. But using a great big thick numb grinding disc isn't going to work for this. It's too, it bounces around too much, you don't really have full control, and you, if you damage that stem, you're screwed. Because there's no way you can put it back on the bike. Because it's weak. And it, it creates a weak point on that stem. And if the bike, you know, if your guy pulls a wheelie or it hits a curb or whatever it is, it has a frontal impact, it's going to snap at that weak point. And then you've got a whole heap of problems coming your way if it's been a job for somebody else. So don't do it. But you can see here on the bearing race, the, the hole where we just to say broke through. And that's what you're looking for. Now we didn't get any, any, any bluing of the metal. Now usually we do, but this time around we didn't. Uh, and when you're using those slit discs, it doesn't really create a lot of heat. You're only taking a very small amount of metal off at any one time. You're just, just eating away at the metal surface. And you can see looking at the back, there was still a reasonable amount of metal left. So feel free to stop whenever you want and give it a whack with a, with a punch. It might start to move. And if it does, you don't need to grind anymore. Okay, let's look at the new bearings and see if they're going to match the old ones. So the ones that I, uh, I purchased are these. And they're steering head bearings. And the part number is a HPS 503 and they're made in Japan. Now if they're made in Japan, that tells us, there's some more information there, look. That tells us that they're going to be good quality. The problem is, they might be the wrong ones. Oh, there's your lower seal. Now, little trick. Put the lower seal on the stem. Put it on the stem right now. Because if you forget to fit that later on, I've done it before, you're screwed. So lower seal on the stem, done. You won't forget it now. And we've got the two bearings in the back. So let's see if the bearing numbers are going to match. Now, the top bearing, I think they're both the same size. We've got, we've got the bearing number on there. I don't know if you guys may be able to see, but you usually have a bearing number etched on the bearing. If it's a really cheap Chinese bearing, it might not have any numbers on it at all. So buy good quality ones. Now, this is a 3200. 3200, okay, so what have we got in the bag? The old ones are 3200. I'm hoping. Yeah, we're on. Okay, 3200 is the new bearing and taper rollers. Perfect. So, is the other one a 3200? That's the question. If it is, then we're going to be okay. And it means I can finish the job. And what have we got? Yes. 3200. Oh, that was a relief. Fantastic. 3200 SX stroke 26. Both bearings are exactly the same. Woohoo! Right, I'm back. Yes, it's a different day, different t-shirt, but we'll continue. Now, um, and in case you're wondering, yes, today's lectures went really well. <laughs> now, um, just before we come to fit the new bearings, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about the old bearings and what was causing what we call indexing. Now, indexing means that the steering on the motorcycle essentially just wants to go to particular positions. It's not... Uh, smooth, it just wants to jump to certain angular points in its, in its sweep, so to speak. And you could see very clearly on the early footage um, that it wanted to go straight ahead. If we moved it a couple of degrees from straight ahead, let go of the handlebars, it would then jump back to the straight ahead position. And it's all to do with the steering head bearings and essentially the races in those bearings. Now this is one of the outer races and pretty sure this is off the bottom one. And they're both the same bearing, so. But if you look in there, and it's going to be really hard for you to see, 
Oh, there you go. Look, there's sort of some really irregular markings in there. It's not going to focus, but anyway, okay. Maybe I know what we'll do. We'll look at it differently. Let's get the Teng Tool mat on the job. Okay, so first off, you can see on that bearing race, there's, you know, a number of sort of irregular markings. Now that kind of stuff is caused by rusting of the bearing and now that will make it rough but it's not going to cause indexing but it'll make it rough. Um, now this is the other race and immediately you can see lines. We've got a line that runs up there and another one that runs up there and another one that runs up there. And if this indexing had been caused by an impact, so the bike hitting a car, then there would only be lines um, around a proportion of the bearing race. But as you can see here, we've got lines all the way around. There you go, look, through the entire duration. We've also got, on the same bearing, quite a bit of rusting going on as well. Okay, so what that tells me is the indexing on this on this um, steering head bearing set hasn't been caused by impact. What has happened though is we've had quite a lot of corrosion going on, i.e. the bike's been stood, it's been stored for quite a few months, maybe years, who knows, at some point in the past, and the bearings have started to rust. Now, not only do the races rust, but so too, uh, so too do the rollers. Now, it's not quite so obvious on the rollers, but these little roller things here, these also rust as well. And whilst the bike's parked, where the roller comes into contact with the race, it's going to corrode more, and it actually eats into the surface, uh, causing a bit of a groove. And that's why the steering indexes. So when you turn the bars, basically that, that roller bearing there wants to be in the groove. And the one next to it wants to be in its groove. So only until the roller runs around to the next groove does it then index again. But if it's somewhere close to the groove, it will actually roll back in. And that's what causes the steering to move back all on its own. So we've got quite a good, um, quite a good example of cor a corroded race, corrosion causing problems to bearings, but also on the same bearing we've got uh, these grooves that we call indexing. Now on the inner race what have we got? Well this was the low one, this is the one that we actually we ground and it, uh, yeah, it's not too bad, I mean there's, oh there you go, Look, yeah looking at it not through the camera, we've actually got quite a lot of damaged the surface and maybe you can hear that with the screwdriver and again that's all down to corrosion it's all quite badly pitted there is some minor indexing on there we can see clearly there are some lines going on the corrosion has occurred you know in a linear form so that's the lower one and I reckon that that race goes with the lower one and uh, this one is the upper inner race. And this out of all of them is, is the one that's about in the, in the best condition. And, well, oh, there's some damage there, look. You can see that on the camera or not. Let's see if we can get it to focus for you. There you go. So there is some damage, again, on the race there. It's irregular damage, so it's not caused um, by the by the roller itself, that's caused just by corrosion, just water getting onto the bearing surface and standing there for a long period of time. And if you look around here, you can see some discoloration on the actual edge of the bearing as well, which again is an indication that it's been rusty at some point. So, that's my verdict. These bearings essentially have become damaged because they've been wet and the water has caused um, erosion to certain points around the bearing surface and it tends to be concentrated where the little rollers are at that time making contact with the bearing surface 
And this indexing hasn't been caused by um, a vehicle impact, you know, a crash, basically. Okay, so there you go, a bit of an insight for you. Okay, so what's next? Well, I'll tell you what's next. We've got to fit the new bearings, haven't we? So we've got the, the new bearings just here, look, top and bottom races. But when they come in the packet, listen to that, they're bone dry. That's no good. You know, we need that to be full of grease. So we've got to pack the bearings, or at least pack the inner race and the rollers and everything. And then we can fit also the outer races back into the, uh, the steerer tube on the bike. Then we can start to reassemble. I mean, to give you an idea, that's what a race should look like. You know, smooth and shiny and no pitting on it and no indexing or anything like that. And once these are in and they're, they've got the preload on, you'll see just how smooth that steering will be. It makes a huge difference to the handling of a bike. It makes it much nicer to ride when the steering head bearings are good. And for any kind of experienced rider, the minute you get on a bike that's got you know, something wrong with the steering head bearings, whether they've been tightened up too much, or they were indexing, or whether they're corroded, or they're too loose, whatever it is, you know pretty quickly that there's something wrong. Right, so I'll, I'd like to show you how to pack these with grease. I'm pretty sure you can work it out. Uh, I'm going to pack up these with grease, and uh, so what we'll do now on camera is we'll move on and we'll fit these outer races into the bike. Here we go. <clears throat> right, now the critical part of fitting these bearing races is that first of all you put them in the right way up. I have come across people that have put them in that way with the small diameter of the race outwards and that is really really bad because you'll never get them out again. Plus of course they won't work. So make sure that the taper is going down towards the inside of the tube. So the larger diameter is facing you and the smaller diameter is on the inside. Or if you're really not sure then the numbers downwards for the top race. Okay, so we're just going to pop that onto there and uh, hopefully you're not going to get too bashed with a hammer. And we're just going to basically work our way around. Now don't forget your eye protection again with this one. And you've got to put the bearing in nice and evenly. Okay, now we've basically gone as far as we can with the hammer with nothing else because it's flush with the top of the tube. But looking inside, we've still got about another three or four mil to go. So I'm going to see if I can find a socket that's going to fit nicely on top of there. So I've managed to find, in this case, what the hell is it? A draper, inch by five sixteenths, inch and five sixteenths socket. And the outer diameter is a fraction smaller than the outside diameter of the bearing, which means it's not going to get trapped in the steerer tube. Okay, so we can just continue to tap that in. Not easy with the camera in the way. I might have to move you. In fact, I think I might have to move you. I can see things going tragically wrong. Now, if you don't happen to have a socket the right size, then you can always use a, a, a soft punch, uh, you know, a copper punch or a, or a brass punch, ideally, so you're not going to damage the, the bearing surface. But we still need to go a little bit further down, so I'm going to move you now so I can hit it properly. Make sure that you're all the way home. The last thing you want to do is have a bearing that's not quite all the way down. That will be rather bad. Great stuff. Okay, that's the uh, the top race 
all the way in, just the bottom one to do now. Okay, so same again, it should be the taper outwards, so the uh, small diameter towards the inside and the large diameter to the outside. That is really, really important. There we go, and now we've bottomed out, we've, we're sort of flush now with the bottom of the tube. We've still got about another three mil to go. So I'll go and get my socket again. Okay. Now, some, very uh, some main manufacturers will have what's called a bearing installer, which is, has, a, has the same taper as the bearing, and it's exactly the right size for the job. Unfortunately, most of us mere mortals don't have that kind of stuff. Well, I think we're about there. I'll have one more quick check around, make sure we're nice and nice and tight. When you get a good solid ring, you know you're in the right place. You know it's all the way home. There we go. Perfect. Okay, we'll just drop some grease onto those. Let's give them a quick wipe around first, put some fresh grease on. And it's ready for assembly. Okay, so those are the two inner races with the rollers and everything, all packed with grease, ready to fit. Now, one of them, we're just going to drop it at the top, aren't we, later on? But the other one needs to go on here. And as you can see, I've already fitted the lower seal. We did that ages ago when we first got the seal out of the box, so we didn't forget. This bearing needs pressing down the stem of the triple clamp. So we can pop it on there, and then I can stick it in the press, upside down, and uh, apply force to the end of the stem here, and hopefully that bearing will end up where it needs to be. That's the plan anyway. Here we go. Okay, so we've got the stem with the bearing. It did just drop over there, it was just a bit caught, and it's ready now to be pressed on. Now. With these bearings, we can't just really stick it straight in there like that, offer that across and press it down. And the reason is it can damage the cage because the cage does, does sit very slightly proud of the inner race. So I've got been rummaging around Ben's bicycle bits and pieces. No doubt it'll kill me because I've used it, but I've just found an old, I don't know, some kind of uh, reducer for the steering head on a bicycle. I'm going to stick that in there, and it's got a smaller diameter than the, than the cage. So when I press it on, the force will be straight onto the inner race and not onto the cage of the bearing. And hopefully that will help to protect it. Right, so we'll pop that in there like that. Bring the whole thing across a little bit. Oh, get off my glove. There we go. And now, all we need to do is just position the whole thing in the uh, in the press. Very very expensive press this one. Made in China, Tiger Tools. It's not expensive at all actually. It's definitely a cheap one, but it works. That's all that matters. And you sort of only really get one chance at this because you know what it's like to get the bearing off and you tend to mutilate it doing that. So we'll just get everything sort of, there we go, a bit of a fine tune, moving things around, and then we can start to apply some pressure. There we 
like yeah. Excellent. Just make sure you there we go, we're all the way down. Perfect. Super job. And yes, I've destroyed Ben's thing, but that doesn't matter. Yes, my apologies, Benjamin. I did sort of <laughs> I did sort of twist up your aluminium spacer a little bit, but hey, it doesn't matter. He's got millions of these kind of things. And that's the kind of stuff you've got to be thinking about when you when you're doing this. Because you only get one chance. And if I damage the cage with those rollers, the bearing's junk. And I've got to get the old one off, well, the new one, off the stem and source another bearing. So, you know, think twice, do once kind of stuff. And there you go. That's the bearing now, the lower bearing, the inner race with the rollers and everything installed onto the stem, ready to go back in the bike. Um, yes, quite a lot of the grease has come off whilst I've been manhandling it, so I'll give it another dose of grease just to also lube up that bearing, uh, the, uh, the seal at the bottom as well. So, that's going to help to hopefully keep some of the moisture out on these bearings or maybe last a little bit longer than the last set, who knows. So that's now ready to install into the bike. So let's do it. Let's get this job finished. <clears throat> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. So offering the stem up and just doing a test fit of the top bearing onto the stem before putting it to camera. It turns out top bearing's wrong. Now we had a sneaky suspicion right at the start that the kit, the old stock kit that I managed to find really, really quickly on the shelf was the wrong one. But it sort of highlights a bit of an issue that the Japanese tend to do with their vehicles. And this isn't just motorcycles. I've had this a lot with the little Suzuki SJ410s, 413s and Samurais, in the transfer boxes and the gearboxes especially, where the Japanese have taken a standard size bearing and machined it slightly differently. So it ends up in a different outside diameter or a slightly different inside diameter. And this is exactly that case. We've got one here. This is the original. Now hopefully you can read this. There you go, look. So it's a 32005. Now that's the bearing size. Then it's got JS stroke 26 okay so it's a natchi bearing and that's a standard number which is uh, 32005 that gives us if you look in a bearing book that tells you the dimensions of the bearing and we've got one here this is the new bearing that came out of that kit which is let's see if I can read it on there look backwards 32005 x stroke 26 you think they're the same bearing, don't you? Now this is obviously only the inner race, and this is only the inner race, and this is the bit that's given me the problem. <sighs> I'll show you the problem. Original inner race, that's just zero verniers. There you go, look, this is zero. And we'll stick that in there. And we've got a reading of 25.8. There is, damn it, 25.8. So it's 25.8 mil ID, inside diameter. Okay, so we'll go back to zero, there you go. And we'll stick it inside the new bearing. The new bearing with the same part number. 24.8. Damn. Damn you, Honda. So close. So that's the difference between a 1982 and a 1983 Honda XL 500 steering head bearing set. One's a little bit different to what it says on the bearing. So I'm going to have to now go to my bearing supplier and see if he can source me the right size top bearing. One with a 24.8 ID rather than a 25.8 ID. Oh well, I'll get that sorted out and I'll come back to you and we'll finish the job. See you later. Right, day three. 
we now have the correct bearing for the top. So I've popped the old outer or the the newer outer race out, installed the third, or the second new outer race, and now we have the correct uh, inner race with the correct inside diameter of 25.8 mil. That was a mission finding that, believe me. Okay, so I'm now going to show you how to assemble the um, the steering head with the top and lower triple clamps and of course the stem fit the bearings and then set the preload now the one thing I won't be able to do on this video is to actually bend over the locking tab because it's missing I've still got that on order that will be here for another couple of weeks unfortunately so um, hey I'll show you what to do but I can't actually physically do it because I haven't got the part go away fly right grab your lower triple clamp and we'll just slide that up through the steerer tube and hold that in position, get your inner race for the top, slide that down, grab the, uh, the little adjuster nut, spin that on there, here we go, that's better, okay, spin that onto the threads, come on threads, you can do this, just make sure that there's no wires and bits and pieces trapped between the lower triple clamp and the frame. There we go. Okay. Excellent stuff. Right. Now, remember rightly, that is all you got as a seal. Now, there should be, going on next, a little tab, basically a washer with, with a couple of sort of tabs that stick out that when you set this correctly, you can align the tab with one of the grooves. Some of them just slot into place. Yeah, this one has this one isn't keyed, so you would actually bend it over into the nut, and that would then just maintain the positioning. Taper roller bearings, which is what this is made up of, require what we call preload. So if you can imagine, we would adjust this nut until all the play had gone between those bearing surfaces. But then to get preload, we then actually tighten it up a little bit further. That's preload. And what that does is it prevents any kind of movement on those bearings, even if there's, they're under high load. And you get taper roller bearings in gearboxes and differential units, especially final drive units and stuff, areas where there's high load. And of course, on these steerer tube bearings, these head bearings, there's a lot of load. They're under a lot of stress, especially if you go around pulling wheelies all the time. So we'll just give that a little tweak, and then we can drop the triple clamp. We'll drop the. Uh, in fact, we'll do that now. Actually, we'll drop that on there. Bring that across. Drop it down, because with those flats in place, I can just give it a tap around with a punch to get the preload how I want it. And all I'm seeing that we're supposed to have this in there, aren't we? And once we have that on there, we can't really. Oh yeah, yeah we can. That's all right. Yeah, we can still, we can still adjust that nut even with that rubber grommet in place and that needs to be there because that's going to keep the help or help to keep the water out of those bearings it's obviously not a very good design because they, they do get uh, they do get allow water in there and it, of course they rust so we'll pop that on there put the washer on and the top nut on there now we're not going to tighten the top nut yet we'll only tighten that once we've set the preload on the on the adjuster nut below now there's there are different designs to this sometimes you have two adjuster nuts and you would lock them together once you get the preload you want others you have um, you know locking washers that you bend over um, just different ways of doing it check your manual find out what needs to be done Right. Okay, so we've got the two triple clamps in place, the lower triple clamp and the top triple clamp, and it's all assembled but loosely. Yes, we've got rid of all the play, but there's currently no preload. Now, really, to do the, do the preload properly, we need to reinstall the fork. So I'll do that now. You don't really need the front wheel in place, and I can't do that because it's all stripped. It's waiting for some spokes to arrive. So I'll drop the forks back in. That's a relatively simple job. And uh, we'll bolt the handlebars back on so we can get some good feel. And then I'll show you how to, uh, to set that preload. Here we go. 
Right, we'll just top these bolts in for now. Now, I, I know that there's other stuff to bolt on as well later on, but this is just to get the forks in for now, and I can pull out bolts and add, add little brackets and stuff later on as, as I need to. And I'm not even going to bother to torque these up to full torque. Not yet. That'll be when I come to do the full front end rebuild. So I'll stick those in there ready. And the top bolts are already in place. So all we need to do now is slide the forks in. Right. Right hand fork first. see some telltale marks, uh, some dirt lines on the forks as to where they were before. A bit higher yet though, Rick. There we go. Right, let's tweak those up. left-hand fork. Now let's not forget that wiring harness has to go under there. There we go. Nearly forgot, didn't we? Okay. Now really important that you get the forks both the same depth in the triple clamp, otherwise it's not going to handle too well and you'll get lots of additional stresses going on. There we go, one, two, one. Go on socket, you can do it. Hmm, maybe a spanner for that one. Like I say, it's only temporary just to hold the forks in place. Okay, now we can. Oh, I've choked that one seized up. Great stuff. Now we can drop the uh, handlebars back into place. Look at that. Easy. Now, handlebar clamps. Stay. I can show you this. Where is it? Yes, there we go, look. Okay, focus. You can see there, there's a little punch mark. Now these are being painted, so it's a bit hard to see. There's a little sort of uh, center punch mark there, and there isn't one at this end. And if the center punch mark goes towards the front. Okay, so that's the handlebars in situ. I'm just, make, I'm just making sure that they're roughly in the right place. And then dot to the front, so we'll pop that on there. Um, both clamps are usually the same, they're not handy. But they do need to be in the right orientation with the dot facing forwards on the bike. Pretty important. Now when you do these clamps up, there should be no gap at the front edge of the clamp and all the gap should be at the back. And the normal torque setting for these, although I'm not going to torque them down just yet, but you'll need to know for the future, is... Um, there we go usually 20 newton meters 
That's the normal clamping force for these bolts. Um, but it's not gospel. So again, you should check with your, with your workshop manual just to be sure. Okay, like I said, I'm just going to tweak these up. And we're not talking them. I'm not even going to bother using the ratchet. I just want it you know, not to move around. That's all I'm doing it for. But the reason why I'm fitting the bars is I'll... If you try and set the preload without the bars, you inherently set it way too low. You need the bars there because they, they change the leverage effect that you have on that bearing set. Okay, so at the moment, when I turn the bars, they're pretty free. Remember these are brand new bearings. If we were fitting the old bearings back in and we just re-grease them or clean them up, then that kind of preload is about right, where there's really... You know, because they're not going to bed in anymore, but the new bearings bed in, so you need to put a slightly more preload on them when they're new, so that once they've worn in, they've still got a little bit of preload left. Right, so to adjust it then, all we need to do is tap that adjust around there with a punch. And to tighten the preload, we'd turn the nut clockwise. So that's rounding this direction. And that should add preload. And essentially, bring the two inner races uh, closer together. You don't normally have to do very much to increase the preload. Right, let's try that. Oh, that feels a lot better. Hmm. Okay, so with the preload, I mean, first of all, all the notchiness has gone away. There's no indexing because it's all, they're all new bearings. What you're, what you're trying to feel for is, is a little bit of resistance, just a little bit of effort to turn the bars. They shouldn't just flap from side to side. If they flap from side to side, you haven't got enough. And realistically, you know, after sort of 100Ks riding or so, you should just double check that there's still no play on the bearings. But actually, I'm quite happy with that. That's great. If you wanted more preload, you'd just tap that just a slightly more. And once you've got it right, if you've got those tabs to bend over, that's when you bend them over. If you've got a lock nut, that's when you lock the two lock nuts together. Okay, so I'm going to whip the bars off, tighten up the top nut, and put the bars back on again. And uh, that will be the job all finished. If I didn't have to wait for the, uh, the, uh, the locking tab washer to arrive. Okay, so now we've got the, uh, the preload set to how we want it. We're just going to whip those bars off again. And then we can tweak up that bolt, that big nut. Oh, fit the speeder. Great stuff. And we should be able to hold the bars out of the way again with our magic, uh, our magic bungees. Okay, just be aware that when you tighten up the last nut, the top nut, it will actually increase preload a fraction more. What it does is basically pushes the, the adjuster nut down on the threads and applies slightly more pressure to those, um, those inner races. Now you have to have the forks installed, otherwise you won't align the, the top and the bottom yokes, the, the triple clamps correctly. And there will be a torque setting for this. Now if you remember rightly, when I pulled this thing apart, this was ridiculously uh, loose. And ridiculously loose is definitely not tight enough. There we go. Okay, now that that's too tight. I'm going to back it off, back off the adjuster a bit, and tighten it back up again. So setting your preload, as I've just highlighted, is a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit of a sort of, well it's an adjustment. And to, to adjust something takes time, and usually takes two or three goes. We'll just back that off. There we go. 
Perfect. We're going to have a punch. Now this time I'm going to punch it round anti-clockwise. And that's going to... That's going to remove some of the preload. I've probably done it about 10 degrees, that's all. Flip it round. And now... And take it back up again. Oh, much better. Okay, so far as oh, rubber grommet. That goes in there. The fuel line to go in and the breather pipe. Cool. And now we can stick the rails back on. Again, for the last time, for now, for a couple of weeks until that part arrives. Now, in your workshop manual, measuring the preload of those ba that bearing set you would normally do using some kind of spring balance or, or scales that can measure the amount of force it takes to start them to rotate. So there will be specs for that preload. Do I have them? No. Will you have them? Probably not. If you don't have them, do it like this. If you do have them, then you'll do it better than me. Usually I do, but on this particular bike being a Honda, I just don't have those specs. Now remember, when tightening these up, always tighten the front ones up first. There should be no gap at the front. Oh, hang on, we've missed something out. We've missed the aftermarket bracket for the speeder. Let's stick that on. There we go. Lovely jubbly. That definitely wasn't a bracket made by Orange County Choppers, was it? No. Okay. Like I said before, these need to be torqued, and uh, normally 20 newton meters. And you can even put thread lock on these bolts if you want. You don't want them. You really don't want them coming undone. Now, let's just double check was that in the right place with the valve before I tweak that up. Excellent, and we'll just stick that down there for now out of the way, that's where it came from. Good job. Yeah, so there is a slight loading on those bearings. It's not excessively tight, you know, you don't want it. If it's too tight, you'll soon know when you start to ride. But you've, you've also got to you know, be aware that they take a few k's to bed in and everything will start to free off. So you don't want them too slack at the start. So there you go. That's how to replace steering head bearings on a motorcycle, on most motorcycles. Obviously there's gonna be a few out there that are just a little bit different. And what would I do differently? Well, it would be a really great idea to get the right bearings to start off with because that's taken me three days to finish this video. Damn, got lots more to do too. Um, what else would I do differently? Well, maybe I could try and find the specs to work out what the preload should be. But I've done it that way for years and years and years and never really had any problems. It's about right. It's, it's how I believe it should be. And most of the time, people don't have the specs available. And if they do have the specs, they haven't got a spring balance to measure it. So it sort of becomes pointless, doesn't it? But I have shown you how to remove, how to strip the front end of the bike down how to remove the old bearings, uh, especially the one off the stem, that's a bit of a skill in itself, and how to get the outer races out of that steerer tube. Yeah, 
the headset, the tube in the frame, call it what you like. And then how to fit the new outer races, how to fit the inner race onto the stem using a press. Now if you haven't got a press, don't panic, just find a piece of steel tube that snugly slides over the stem and onto the inner race, the bearing, and you can just rest the whole thing on a block of wood and just give it a tap down with, it, with your magic hammer. You know, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and that's how I used to do them before I bought a press. And not many people have presses, so, you know, sort of the way it is. But just take care and remember to fit that lower seal first before you put the bearing on. Now, I know one or two of you will forget that and you'll go, oh, you told us three times. Yes, I have forgotten it in the past as well. Such is life. Um, well, there you go. I hope you found the video helpful. If you've got any questions or comments, do leave them down the bottom and I'll do my very best to get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Now, if you'd like to subscribe, and more the merrier, we're nearly at 250 subscribers, which is fantastic. Really, really chuffed with that. Um, who knows, we might make 500 subscribers in the first year. That would be great. Um, if you do subscribe, why not click on the little gear symbol next to it and turn on notifications. And that way you'll receive an email from YouTube as and when I upload any new videos. Now, of course, you don't have to watch them. If they're not appealing to you, just, just ignore it. Just delete the email and forget all about the fact that I exist. But if, you know, the off chance you might find, hey, I always wanted to know how to do that, then you can watch the video and maybe, just maybe, I can teach you something. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you could teach me something. Stick it on a comment. Let me know because I'm always learning too and that's what life's all about. Okay, well, you've been watching the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Cheers, crew. Thanks for watching. Over and out.